Well, hello and welcome to this event uh, with Gavin Esler, uh, Can Federalism Save the United Kingdom, promoted by the Glasgow Liberal Democrats. My name is David McKenzie. Uh, I am the candidate for Glasgow Kelvin for the Scottish Liberal Democrats, and I'm delighted to be joined this evening by Gavin Esler. For anybody who doesn't know who Gavin Esler, and I can't imagine there's many people who are interested in politics that don't know who Gavin is. Gavin is obviously an author, uh, a broadcaster, has presented numerous programmes, including BBC Newsnight for a number of years. And Gavin has recently authored a new book called How Britain Ends, um, the, four nation, the Rise of Four Nations and English Nationalism. Um, Gavin, thank you for joining us. Yeah, I mean, the idea for How Britain Ends um, came about because I was in Edinburgh, which is where... I went to school for the 2019 Edinburgh Book Festival. I was hanging out with a lot of my old friends and we we're talking about the impact of the Brexit vote and talking a bit about the referendum in 2014. And Edinburgh, as you know, is a small C conservative city. It's not, you know, change doesn't come. People don't like big changes in Edinburgh. In fact, the street plans not changed for a couple of hundred years, even in the, the new town. And Quite a few of my friends, uh, some voted yes on independence in 2014, but most of them voted no, as did Edinburgh. And they, ones that voted no to independence, quite a few of them had changed their minds and they were very angry about being taken out of the European Union against their will. And uh, one or two of them suggested that the, uh, the government in Westminster was fundamentally broken and didn't represent them and hadn't represented, I mean, Scotland, of course, as a whole, had not voted for a Conservative government since the 1950s. Uh, and so that, that just stuck in my head. Uh, and one of them actually said to me, when Boris Johnson says he is a one nation Conservative, that one nation is England. And this is somebody who I know had lived in England and had lived all over the world. He was certainly not your classic kind of uh, he was an internationalist rather than a Scottish nationalist, it seemed mm. to me. So that was interesting. And then a couple of months later, I was in Belfast, where I've also got roots of, I come from a west of Scotland, uh, uh, Protestant family with some roots in County Antrim in Northern Ireland, like many of us in the west of Scotland. And uh, I was back in Belfast in October 2019. It was two days after Boris Johnson had got his famous border in the Irish Sea, essentially. Mm. The border now, which he says has ludicrous trade arrangements, the ones he signed up to. Um, and it, the words ludicrous didn't come to mind to some of the people I was talking to in October, 2019 in Belfast. They were much ruder. Uh, some suggested that he'd thrown a hundred years of unionism into the sea. Um, uh, one said to me, Mrs. Thatcher said, Northern Ireland is as British as Finchley. Boris Johnson has made it as British as France. Now you can agree or disagree with any of those sentiments, but that's how, how, how people felt. And I started to think about what holds the United Kingdom together in the 21st century, because like most, like most Scots, we know that the UK had its roots in 1603, the Union of the Crowns. And anybody who reads history at all will know it's been reinvented every hundred years since then. 1707, the mm -hmm. Union of the Parliaments, which was obviously very controversial in Scotland at the time, and still is for, some, for, for many people. 1801, Ireland joined, 1921-22, in the most brutal circumstances because there was no federal system that Ireland could exist within. Uh, 26 counties seceded. And I thought, is it time to try to reinvent the United Kingdom or at least think why we are in a United Kingdom? What, what does it unite us? I mean, we know about the language and some of us, uh, you know, I live in England. Uh, and most of my friends now are English, but I've got friends in Scotland and relatives in Scotland and in Northern Ireland. And I've lived in Wales for a few months. What is it that actually holds us together now? Because the historical glue of Britishness, according to Linda Colley and lots of, just about any real, uh, really good historian who's studied what Britishness means, if anything, is it was Protestantism, empire and war. And so my challenge to unionists 
um, uh, which obviously includes you and your party and, 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 and so on, is what does a United Kingdom mean for us anymore? And my challenge to nationalists is you want independence, but what does an independent Scotland or any independent country or even the supposed independence of Brexit mean in a clearly independent world, interdependent world, where we're, um, it's not just in economic terms that we're interdependent, or trade terms, or even coronavirus, where obviously that's a, an international threat, but everything from money laundering to crime to, you know, uh, where we go on our holidays and how we travel around, we are very interdependent. So. There's a challenge to nationalists and I think a challenge to unionists. And it seemed to me, just a final thought uh, uh, on this, it seemed to me that there are plenty of people who are making um, a nationalist case in Northern Ireland, a, a nationalist case in, in, in Scotland. Uh, there are, I cannot think of a British figure or particularly an English figure who's making a coherent case for the United Kingdom and a coherent unionist case, because if that's Boris Johnson, it's not going to work because both in terms of the messenger and the message, as, as you well know, David, he doesn't travel very well. He speaks no. for some people, but I suspect not for many of the people engaged in this call and many of those too. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, first of all, Gavin, for that that overview. So, obviously, um, I, I mentioned before we started that I spent uh, many a night leafleting in Gav uh, Glasgow Kelvin listening to the to the book on Audible, uh, and there was a number of things that I found quite interesting, not only because I think um, uh, there's very interesting parallels, I think, between uh, both of us. Um, obviously, I grew up in the west of Scotland. I'm, I'm from Greenock originally, you're from Clyde Bank, but it's not... 100 million miles away. Um, my great grandfather was from Belfast. Um, so we've got that sort of Protestant unionist background that came across to Scotland within my within my family. Um, and obviously, in 2014, uh, I, I was part of the, the Better Together campaign, while I uh, lived in Scotland. And then subsequently, I moved down south for work and lived in London, and then subsequently in, uh, in Reading for a number of years, uh, where I was during the 2016 uh, referendum and campaigned for Remain. And what I found quite interesting during that period of time was um, I almost slightly lulled myself into a false sense of security because I was campaigning at home when I went to see my mum and dad um, and people were very pro-Remain. I was campaigning in London after work, which was very pro-Remain. Uh, and obviously Reading and Berkshire was very, very pro-Remain. Um, but my partner, uh, my, my now fiancé, is from Derbyshire. Um, and when we went to visit her parents, when I went around some of these towns and villages in this area, uh, there was a real overwhelming backlash um, towards the European Union. And in some aspects, subsequently since, I have seen this real move, as you talked in the book, towards kind of this concept of English nationalism. Um, and there has been a rise of that. I guess what you were saying there about the the you know the sort of challenge to unionists about who's going to make the case for a for a United Kingdom. Obviously, we you talk in the book about federalism and the move towards a, a more federal Britain. Do you think something that always gets attacked quite a lot is people who say, well, federalism isn't unionism, but do you think there needs to be a a view as to what what federalism means for the union and is it viewed as a type of unionism or do you think it's something entirely different? Yeah, you see that, I, I, yeah, I think that's a very interesting kind of series of discussions there, David. And and the one thing I would say is, uh, my wife was born in Hamburg. If you go to Germany, nobody says federalism isn't part of being German. It's absolutely the core of being German. Uh, if you go to the United States, nobody would say, well, maybe there's a few left in the Confederacy, I don't know, but <laughs> most, most normal, most, most people would say federalism is about being American, absolutely about being American. And the same is true in Canada and the same is true in Australia. So it's not, it's not just some kind of um, 
you know, European imposition or European peculiarity, it, even those who, who, you know, as you know, there's a, there's a divide between some of us who, who think that our future is with Europe, which I happen to think, but we should have good relationships with the other English speaking countries and others who, who think that, you know, there's some kind of Canada, New Zealand, UK, Australia union. Well, all the, the, we're talking not, not New Zealand, but the others are, basically federal countries, federal countries, and it works for them. And part of the thing I say in the book is that we have become federalized by stealth and a kind of blundering, uh, in a blundering way. Sometimes we've um, thought through what it means, but mostly we haven't. Mark Drakeford, the Labour um, uh, First Minister in, in Wales is saying, you know, that one of the problems he's finding is that the Westminster government chooses when it's going to talk to me and when it's not? I mean, he puts it more more elegantly, but that's basically what he what, what he means. And so, so what what we've done is we've not just, I mean, by we in this sense, I mean the United Kingdom, given more powers to Scotland, different way for Northern Ireland, different way in Wales, but each of which has got better system for electing politicians than Westminster or the English people in Derbyshire that you met. So we've done that. We've sort of federalized the BBC and some of the other great institutions. I, I was really surprised, I'd never really thought about it, that in terms of the National Health Service, how this great idea, which is a very British idea, is so wonderful because it is devolved, because mm. uh, there are four chief medical officers, one for Scotland, one for Northern Ireland, one for Wales and one for England. And I hadn't really thought about that. And then, then you go through the stuff that we all know if you grow up in Scotland about Scottish church is different, the, the, the university system is different, the education system is different. Uh, you know, I, I did hires. I had to, as I say in the book, I had to explain to some English academics sometimes that hires were not A levels, and I wasn't actually going to do A levels when I came to, before going to university. <laughs> so we've done all these things, and we have we are different, but we are united, or we have been historically united by certain things. And my suggest my suggestion in the book, although, as you know, uh, many nationalists think think the F word has now is now history, but that we have already got a federalized system. And it might cause less pain if the Westminster government were, uh, woke up to the fact, two things, that they're not that popular. They've got 43% of the vote, and that's 43.6% uh, of the vote, and yet a thumping majority. And the same was true of, you know, the Tony Blair administrations, and that the Westminster system is fundamentally broken and that from the era of the horse and cart. And that secondly, there is a system throughout the British Isles of uh, devolution, which works for most people, but doesn't work in England, because it, you know whether whether you construct an English Parliament or not. I mean, that's another complicated debate. But it seemed to me, looking at a lot of the academic research, talking to people as you've done, and the the real dispiriting conversations about many English people I've talked to who say the Westminster government doesn't represent me. Um, I was fed up with politics, so I, I wanted to give two fingers up to the system. That's why I voted for Brexit. I, I completely get that. But unfortunately, it's got us to the mess that we're in today, which is different parts of the United Kingdom going different ways, wanting different things, and nobody really trying to coherently pull those together. And unfortunately, I think a government in Westminster, which which tells you today that what it said yesterday wasn't the case, I mean, and, and tomorrow will deny what it said today. So we are, it seems to me, at a really, really difficult stage for those who believe in, in the union of the United Kingdom, because it doesn't seem to work in practice, because we haven't codified it in any way, and we haven't decided who's really in charge of what. Hello, John from the Lib Dem podcast here. We are delighted to say that this episode is sponsored by Prater Reigns. Now more than ever, you need a professional-looking online presence and website. Prater Reigns have been helping Liberal Democrat campaigns succeed for 18 years. Their Lib Dem foci package combines a website, social media and email system to help Lib Dems win. You'll receive great support from real people, fair pricing and a huge range of features to choose from. 
Praetor Reigns are already the bespoke developers for Lighthouse, Lib Dem Draw Online and the LD Directory. They combine a talented system design with an unrivaled understanding of our party, our data and our systems. To find out more, check out the Praetor Reigns website at praetorreigns.co.uk slash liberal-democrats. This podcast has been sponsored by the Katora Coffee Club, the UK's most environmentally friendly coffee club. There are over 400 independent roasters in the UK, each one crafting coffee in their own unique style. Katora Coffee Club works with some of the best to take you on a voyage of coffee discovery. The Katora Coffee Club delivers ethically sourced and independently roast coffee directly to your door. Each month you'll receive between two and four bags of coffee and their monthly extract magazine. Even better for Lib Dem podcast listeners, use the code BETTERCOFFEE to save 5% on subscriptions and gift boxes for a limited time only. All Katora Coffee Club boxes are carbon negative and offset the CO2. So why not do some good, enjoy some great coffee and check out the website www.katoracoffeeclub.com. Now, back to the podcast. There's an interesting, I guess, sort of follow-on piece there when um, talking about codifying and, and the, the devolution of powers. Um, obviously, recently, Boris Johnson was quoted as saying, I think, in a private conversation that uh, devolution was Tony Blair's worst idea uh, and it caused no end of problems. But I actually think it's it's more, as you say, it's because we, we've sort of done it in a half-hearted manner and gone halfway without really putting substantial powers in place and, and having a and you go in to talk about this, a written constitution that would allow people to interpret how those powers work in a, in a federal in a federal UK? Well, one of the things which uh, I write about in the book, which really struck home to me, is woke up one morning, switched on the Today programme, found out that Boris Johnson was in hospital with the coronavirus, and that Dominic Raab was going to be in charge. <laughs> now, why? This was... A, <laughs> I'm <laughs> Chancellor of the University of Kent, and uh, he is the man who is most famous in Kent for not actually understanding that there was some kind of relationship between Dover and Calais. I can go to the Kent coast and see the lights of Calais, <laughs> you know. So I thought, why is it? And I looked, at, I listened to, uh, and I got the transcripts from some of the interviews done, and it was well. His powers, yes. What are his powers? Well, could he could he launch a nuclear strike? Well, we're not terribly sure about that. Why is it Dominic Raab? Well, we're not terribly sure about that. What are the limits on what he can do? Uh, we're not ter- we're not terribly sure. And of course, when you listen to constitutional experts, they talk and they kind of break into laughter about the glories of the writ- unwritten constitution. And when you read about it, Lord Macaulay, for example, classic sort of Whig view of history, he said that uh, uh, a written constitution is like paper money, but an unwritten constitution is pure gold. Well, uh, I, you know, in the shops of Glasgow, you don't spend pure gold. We've, we've, we've gone on beyond paper money, actually, to plastic money and Bitcoin. Mm. And the, the, the whole the whole kind of worship of having an unwritten constitution isn't borne out by the fact that British experts have written constitutions for 70 different countries around the world or helped do it, including Germany, for example, and most of the, the, the former colonies. So we, we kind of, this we've muddled through for a thousand years thing, uh, which is not something most Scots say, but is part of the kind of um, the English nationalist myth, actually. Uh, is really detrimental to some hard thinking about the fact it doesn't work anymore. Mm-hmm. And there's some interest in, in the books. Uh, there was a couple of things I wanted to discuss while we're talking about English nationalism. So um, for, for before, so to give this some context for anybody that is listening, so in, uh, in, I joined the Liberal Democrats in 2019 and I, I'd been in the Labour Party for, for over a decade before that. And I um, and I founded the uh, Fabian Society's Devolution and Local Government Network. And, and that time I'd had uh, some very interesting conversations with someone you mentioned in the book, which is John Denham um, and, and mm-hmm. his work as well on English identity. But I guess the, the question about English nationalism, 
obviously when we're looking at a federal Britain, do you feel then that there's a, an English political or geographical identity that needs expression? Because obviously there's some people who would say, well, actually, Yorkshire wants representation or the North East wants representation or Cornwall, for instance, has a particular identity that they feel strongly about rather than England. Um, I'd just be interested to see if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, that is interesting. And John Denham is is, is a very interesting uh, uh, writer and thinker about this as well. But I think what I notice is that the dearth of thinking about this within England, and part of it is this constant elision, which it doesn't annoy me, but I uh, know it, it, it used to annoy my dad uh, sometimes between being English and being British. And, you know, that people... Uh, Scots and people in Northern Ireland, people in Wales, don't make the mistake of thinking those are identical. Whereas um, I quote quite a lot of this in the book, sometimes for comic effect, you know, like Cecil Rhodes saying, ask any man anywhere in the world what he'd rather be in 99% say he'd rather be an Englishman. Well, you know, even 120 years ago, in a Glasgow pub or a Belfast pub, or a Wales pub, you weren't going to say that, were you? So, um, so, so the, there's there's that side of it, not really thinking it through, and the, the that causes a lot of, I think, a lot of problems because it happens even now. When I, I was on, the book is called How Britain Ends, and I was on a radio program. I won't say who the, the name of the presenter is, but she did say, and Gavin Esther joins us, uh, author of a book called How England Ends, <laughs> and I said. <laughs> No, there'll always be an England, but there may not always be a United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And at the end of the interview, he said that was Gavin Esther, the author of How England Ends. So, so it's it's still quite current. But, but what I what I do think about English nationalism is that many English voters have got a right to be grie- aggrieved. For example, in 2015, 3.8 million people, most of them in England, voted for UKIP and they got one seat, which was Douglas Carswell, who quit the party. So they got nothing. And I don't share almost any view with with UKIP. I think in, in some ways UKIP was a great confidence trick. But I do share the feelings of those UKIP voters who thought that our democratic system was in some way going to put into parliament people who represented their views and they got nothing. That is profoundly unfair. And I think that many people, um, I've talked to quite a few, who are of that persuasion decided that it was all Europe's fault in some way, in a kind of, in my view, quite incoherent way that, that, that Europe had imposed something on them. That's not the case. That is the British system. And in large part, it, unfortunately, it is the English system because England is the biggest part of the union. And so, so I, I, it's, it's hardly surprising that when voters see a functioning parliament in whatever you think of the politics of a functioning parliament in Edinburgh, a mostly functioning parliament in Northern Ireland, diff- different problems, but a functioning parliament of some sort in, in Wales, and they feel that they are somehow not represented by the political classes. And I, I, I get that. And I'm not sure how that expression, I don't think John Denham is either, of views should be translated into changing our constitutional structures. Because I don't think, I mean, you're right about Cornwall, but we're not going to get Wessex and East Anglia and so on as coherent units. Although I do think some of the great cities of, of, of England uh, London in particular is a London identity, and I certainly think there's a West Midlands identity. Um, Newcastle in the North East is slightly different because there's such rivalries. So I'm not sure how it will play out, but I do think the democratic deficit that if you're a unionist, you should worry about is one in England in particular. Mm-hmm. And there was some interesting aspects in the book when you discussed sort of Scottish nationalism versus English nationalism and the the types of nationalism that they represent and I always and I, I try to be as um uh, as, as, as unbiased as possible in these situations because obviously having campaigned in 2014 to, re, uh, to, to remain a member of the United Kingdom it, sometimes it is difficult to take the sting out of the things you experienced in that campaign um, and, and look at things in, in that context because 
the obviously you know as you mentioned in the book Nicola Sturgeon talks about you know, civic nationalism um, as her representation of Scotland I would certainly feel that there would be people from you know myself or, or people who I campaigned with who felt that in 2014 it was uncomfortable at times sometimes aggressive um, in fact I, I actually campaigned with an, an elderly English gentleman who got punched in the face and told to leave um, which I felt was totally unacceptable but I do appreciate that's the minority and it's not the majority of people that do those sorts of things but what I was interested is because and I appreciate this has come after you've written the book obviously Alex Salmon's now launched this new Alba party and um, which will be standing for the Scottish Parliament elections and I don't know if you'd seen this recent uh, video that he put out about Robert the Bruce and uniting the clans and uh, and having the guy from Braveheart that played Robert the Bruce do the voiceover. Do you think there's a section now of the Scottish national uh, nationalism movement that are moving again towards maybe something that's not very civic? Mm, well, that that is a very good question. I mean, I think I, I think to take one step back first. All nationalisms have a dark side. I mean, we know that from there's nothing wrong with supporting Germany if you're in German, uh, if you're a German, but there were plenty of patriotic nationalistic Germans who were fine, and then there was quite a few who weren't. And that's true of every nationalism. And I end the book with a sort of suggesting the metaphor of the Kelpies, um, that, that nationalism might look like a lovely pony and you get on top of it and you might find that you're not having such a good time. Uh, so, so your point is well made, and I agree with you about 2014. I got, because I was working for the BBC at the time, horrendous abuse from some cybernats uh, who just, I mean, just nutters, frankly, uh, who are no different from the two world wars and one world cup fringe of English nationalism or some of the Irish nationalists, which I've come across, or Ulster nationalists, I suppose you could call them. So. Every nationalism has its, has, has its uh, dark side. What I would say is, and this, uh, let me put it in the context of Sinn Féin, because I spent a lot of time in Northern Ireland. I was never in any sense anything other than appalled by the IRA campaign. Uh, but I met many people in Sinn Féin and the IRA and so on. And they have a very, very dark past. But they're not anti-immigrant. They don't seem to be a racist party. There are probably some, you know, there's some in every society of the, you know, punching an English person in the face, as you 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 say, some appalling stupidity like that. And there are some people in Ireland that, that are like that. Uh, and there's some people in Scotland that are like that. But one of the interesting things is that neither Scotland or Ireland has got a strongly anti-migrant section uh, in their political life. Whereas in England, we have had the Theresa May government talking about a hostile environment to people uh, who, who'd come here illegally, but doing it in a particular way, which was quite pernicious, because it gave permission to, uh, I'm not suggesting she's a racist by any means. And in fact, the Conservative Party in England has gone quite a long way to make sure people of colour are in important positions. And that's great. But to say that you're creating and you're calling it a hostile environment and the attitude to migration is one which gives permission to people who are much nastier they think to do some uh, to do some some things which we're all appalled by so i think there are differences there are differences in all kinds of nationalism and i'm absolutely not you know I, <laughs> there are some nasty strands in, in Scottish nationalism. I would also suggest that there's some nasty strands in Scottish unionism, not you. I'm not, I'm not saying anybody in this call, but we all know what I'm talking about, that there no, are no, people no. who have certain bigotries that uh, that, that neither, none of us uh, particularly want to get involved with. Yeah, no, no, I, t I totally get that. It's, um, <laughs> I, I, I always I always equate to, obviously I've lived down in England for a few years now, trying to explain the... Um, uh, the west of Scotland upbringing, uh, you know, depending on which football team you support, and then uh, you know, yeah. uh, in fact, funnily enough, um, sorry, this this very quick sidebar. Uh, when I took my first job working in um, Erskine over the Erskine Bridge at Hewlett Packard, I had a colleague whose first question to me was, "What school did you go to?" <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> I, I know yeah. exactly what that question's asking me. It's asking me what religion am I. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's um, the Belfast question as well. I know that very well. <laughs> if you say since something or other, somebody knows. Or my my, my favourite was uh, when I, I, I was going to Glasgow doing a bit of, bit of work and I got in a taxi at Glasgow Airport. I was living in London at the time. And the, the taxi driver said to me, I had one of your BBC fellows in the car last night. I said, oh, dear, I'm wondering where this is going. And he said, uh, yeah, he said to me, your team did really well last night. <laughs> and his team wasn't Celtic. Let's put it, put it <laughs> oh, I'm surprised. I don't know what happened to the uh, BBC guy. He was probably thrown in the Clyde somewhere. <laughs> It's um, you know it's interesting, and that's actually something I maybe wasn't going to touch on as much. But there is there is a a, a kind of unfortunate and undertone that happens with um, depending on what side of the debate on independence or uh, or or you know unionism, uh, and especially in the west coast of Scotland, that's kind of in a tragic way tied to religious identity, which I think it has nothing to do with. But a lot of the time, because as I mentioned, you know, I come from a, a Protestant background. I'm not religious at all. I'm, I'm just not. Um, but because I, you know, have family that came from Northern Ireland, it was viewed as, oh, because you grew up in a Protestant background, Ranger supporting, of course you're going to be a unionist. When in actuality, I'd campaigned with many, many people who, you know, came from Catholic backgrounds, were Celtic supporters and didn't support independence. But it, it's to me, it seems a real shame that it, it's pushed down those divide lines when it's really something that has nothing to do with that. Yeah, that, yeah I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, I've got, I've got a very good friend who's a Catholic background from Derry or London Derry, depending on when, but he would call it Derry. And we had a conversation with uh, a group of people from the Irish Republic. And uh, uh, Marty, my, my friend, was the one who expressed most doubts about Irish unity. Not because he didn't want it, because he wasn't sure how you would integrate people from the North. And his friends from the Republic of Ireland were saying, no, no, nationalism in a way will triumph over sectarian divisions. And I'm not clear whether, whether that will or will, will not happen. But it was interesting that those of us from the west of Scotland or with a Northern Ireland background are very sensitive to this issue, that uh, there are some things that, uh, some values that people have, which may not quite seem to fit with the rest of the 21st century, but they are quite well held values and they have to be kind of, not just challenged with they get out of hand, but actually you have to understand where people are coming from and why they're why they're saying it, and that's very difficult, I think, in, in political life. Mm. And that sort of actually uh, leads me on to my next question uh, very well, which um, we've talked about this idea of a federal UK. And one question that I've always had in the back of my head is, you know, could Northern Ireland deal with a federal UK? Because I feel like that might cause more mm. problems for Northern Ireland than we might think in terms of, you know, it's not that long ago, they did not have a functioning government for a couple of years. Do you foresee that we would we'd really have to think very, very hard about what that would mean for Northern Ireland if we went to a federal system? Yeah, I mean, I spent a lot of time, and it was my first job was with the Belfast Telegraph and, and journalism, uh, and then uh, worked for the BBC in Northern Ireland. So I was there, the wor absolutely the worst of the troubles, I was there for the hunger strikes and all kinds of Horrible things. So, uh, uh, and that's why I'm so incensed at the stupidity of this, uh, the way in which the Brexit has been managed for, for people in Northern Ireland, whatever side of the political or sectarian divide you're from. Um, and therefore I do I agree absolutely. Having taken 30 years to get to a degree of peace through the Good Friday Agreement, we are, well, Boris Johnson actually, and it is him personally, is uh, perhaps going to blow it completely, and I hope not. And so, therefore, federalism is a real is is going to be quite difficult. But George Osborne, you know, um, obviously former Chancellor of the Exchequer, he said in a recent article in January this year, too late for inclusion in the book, unfortunately. Um, uh, but he said that he thinks Northern Ireland is already out the door, halfway out the door. And he said that uh, Scottish independence is, is inevitable unless you stop Scottish people voting for it, which 
I think is classic defeatism of, of unionism, if that's, if that's your best case. Um, but he's on to something about Northern Ireland, which is that there's actually now three kind of groups in Northern Ireland. There are those who are mostly Protestant and unionist who were in the majority, but are not quite now, or it's just very close. Uh, there are those who are Catholic and nationalist and um, are, were in the minority, but it's very close. And there's actually quite a big wedge in the middle um, of people who are not that bothered um, and would rather just see peace and prosperity and see a new future and want integrated education and so on. So Northern Ireland has changed and the Irish Republic has changed. It's a much richer country than it was in 1973 when it joined the common market, when Britain did. Uh, per, per capita, their GDP was two thirds of ours in 1973. And it's now, we're, we're just about half of what the Irish GDP per capita is. Most, uh, you, I, I've said that to audiences, please check it, um, but it's true. Ireland, uh, and Ireland's got some problems with poverty, like everybody else, it's got lots of you know, rich and poor and so on, but it's done really well. So the tectonic plates of the Union of the United Kingdom are changing anyway. And they may change in Northern Ireland eventually, and, 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 and not everybody will be happy with any kind of solution. And frankly, if I, uh, uh, I've, I've also got some relatives in County Kerry, and I'm not sure they're entirely pleased at the thought of one million people of unionist extraction joining their country. But uh, most of them, I think, would want it in the end. And, and, and that would be extraordinary. And so one of the reasons I wrote the book actually is to say that people in Northern Ireland have thought about this for generations and in the Republic and in Scotland and in Wales in different ways. And if these different parts of our tectonic plates move, it's English people who are gonna be sitting there going, wait a minute, what actually happened in the last 20 years? Why is it that Faslane is closed. Why is it we don't have permanent five membership of the UN Security Council because the United Kingdom has got the seat but it doesn't exist anymore? What, why do we have a border potentially um, on the mainland of, of the United Kingdom between Scotland and, and England? And it was an attempt to make people think about it, of which Northern Ireland is a part um, in terms of uh, thinking about it. And I have to say that the current government has not really thought about Northern Ireland at all. Whatever you think about Brexit, the idea that within the space of one meeting with Leo Varadkar, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, would decide to abandon 100 years of Ulster Unionism and just say, oh yeah, that border, which I thought was no more important than the border between Camden and Westminster, we're now gonna just sort of have it for customs terms in the, in the, in the Irish Sea. I mean, I read a lot of the news, the unionist newspaper, the newsletter in Northern Ireland, mm. and they are appalled and outraged by this. And it's not surprising that some of the yobs and teenagers get on the streets and cause a bit of trouble for a number of reasons, but that is one of them because they feel very insecure. So <laughs> it's a long way around to answer your question, but the future of Northern Ireland has already been upset tremendously by the incompetence of uh, the people who negotiated the deal which Boris Johnson signed. Mm-hmm. It's, um, it's actually interesting. I had a, I had a, a conversation um, a number of months back on a, on a podcast that I record with um, uh, Ian Marshall, who was the former uh, independent unionist senator in the Shannad in Ireland. Um, and actually, weirdly enough, he's running in a by-election tomorrow to to get re-elected into the Shannad. Um, and I think he's the first unionist in the Shannad for over 100 years or so. Um, but he's not a member of the DUP or the UUP, but he was a former president of the Ulster Farmers Union. And uh, and I, what's interesting is, is his, although he is a unionist, there's a lot of he doesn't have the hard line views that some of the unionist parties in, in Northern Ireland have. And he, he very interestingly spoke about his admiration uh, for Seamus Mallon and his idea of this shared home place. Um, and, and I do think, you know, as you rightly say, there is multiple attitudes uh, changing in Northern Ireland. And, and obviously our sister party is the Alliance Party, who, you know, 
it benefits from having people who mm -hmm. are both unions who come from a unionist background, come from a republic background, or or come from neither. So I, I think it's going to be interesting to watch what happens in Northern Ireland uh, in the in the coming years. But before I move on to to questions from the audience, Gavin, I, I just wanted to ask you. Obviously, you've said at the start there's there's no real voice from a British perspective making the case to the whole UK, or or particularly from an English perspective as to the reasons to stay how do we fix that and i guess the question would be is what perhaps could the liberal democrats be doing to make a better case for the united kingdom as a whole but also how we move the united kingdom forward yeah I, again that's that is a very very good question um i can it's easier to say what you can't do and one of the things you can't do is go on about land of hope and glory and uh, rule Britannia and and confect rows about cultural uh, you know culture wars rows is I suppose what I'm saying because what has ha what has happened and one of the things that appalls me in the past couple of years is the rows about statues and 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 so on and uh, taking a kind of fossilized view of history and saying this is our history and not an inch and we're not going to move forward from this and so on. Now I'm not in favour of throwing statues and rivers and things but I am in favour of thinking about the history of our country from different perspectives including those of people who feel for one reason or another whether it's because they were Catholic or because they're of colour or whatever uh, or women uh, who, who feel that they have been out, left out of some of the stories and they would like to tell those stories. And I don't see a threat in it. That's not, a, that's not saying we want less history, we want more history. And telling people that they should have the Union flag on somewhere just seems, to, one of the things that struck me about that is how very un-British. If, if, if it's been British to tell you you should have lots of Union flags, I, I think if people want to have the Union Jack, that's great. If people don't want to have the Union Jack, that's fine. I don't, I don't get that. So what you have to do is you have to, it seems to me at least, is you have to make a case for those things. You have to put it this way, that the many things which don't work in this country, meaning the United Kingdom, can be solved, you have, would have to say, by the many things that are right about this country. So the things that are right about this country, it seems to me, are that we're incredibly smart, we're very creative, and this is not Westminster, by the way, when I say we are very smart, I don't mean Westminster, but I mean, we have great universities, we have incredibly creative people, we have three of the, you know, if you look at the, some of the biggest selling movies, they're based on British writers, J.K. Rowling, Ian Fleming, you know, and uh, and, J and J.R.R. Tolkien, there's, you know, we, we, we are full of, not just in the history, but right now, of incredibly inventive people. But we don't turn our attention to um, reinventing ourselves as, as, as British. And you can't just sell something by putting a Union Jack on it. You can sell it to some people, but you can't sell it to many people who are thinking, what is this country about? And so what you have to do is, and, and this is a moment because of the passing of Prince Philip and so on, this is a moment when people should really be thinking about, uh, you know, does the monarchy bring us together? Uh, the Queen has done, in my view, at least a remarkable job, astounding job. So what, what happens next? How do we go from here? What is the future? And the reason I come back to what nationalists of different types uh, have, have said is nationalists have uh, whether you agree with them or not, have been thinking about this for quite a long time and have been articulating it. And the kind of, the, the Britishness debate has gone by default being, I, I mean, I've, I quote lots of people in the book who essentially say we've, we've muddled through for a thousand years, it's all going to be fine. Well, that is nonsense. And, and, and David Frost, Lord Frost, the person who negotiated our Brexit deal, has said that one of the reasons, I quote him extensively, because I think it's so irritating. He says that, uh, he said about 18 months ago, that one of the reasons that Britain didn't fit in with Europe was these Europeans have kind of devised systems and, and done things like this, whereas we have just kind of evolved our political system. That is utter rubbish. 
we didn't devote we didn't just evolve as the suffragettes we didn't just uh, you know evolve as the 1832 reform act we didn't just evolve devolution these were things that people have fought for for for, for years so uh, the biggest problem is to step back from that complacency. If you can step back from that complacency and look at all the good things which are true about this country, which is it sometimes takes real battles uh, and you have to make an intellectual case and you don't just muddle through. Muddling through has got us into the Brexit mess and that's, um, and we still seem to be muddling through with it, with the, with, with the prime minister. So. Uh, and I say in the book, muddling through has gone from being a, a kind of way of operating to being a destination. <laughs> it's quite extraordinary. <laughs> that's where that's where we are. So no muddling through. Think about the flags. Don't tell people that it's great to be British. Don't go on about how we're world beating, which uh, about all these things. If we're not, if we are world beating, that's fantastic. But. Um, we have been oversold this 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 product, unfortunately, and I think it's going to take a lot of actually quite realistic talk to do it, which may not help you as a as a party, but uh, I think that is the core. You've got to be honest with people because this crisis, this will develop into it seems to me inevitably a constitutional crisis in a country without a constitution that anybody can understand. Thanks, Kevin. So I'm going to open it up now to some questions from the audience. So um, if you are able to, if you could want to ask a question, if you can put a hand up so I can unmute you and then I'll ask you to ask and you can raise your hand by pressing the button that says reactions and then raise a hand. I'm hoping people have some questions they would like to ask Gavin. <laughs> May have beaten everybody into, uh, <laughs> into science. Come on, people, let, don't let, be let, shy. <laughs> ah, okay, we do have one question. So from Colin. Colin, if you just unmute yourself. Hi. Hi there. I was <clears throat> uh, enjoying what you were saying about um, uh, being world beating. I was uh, nearly chucking things at the radio earlier on today as uh, Anne-Marie Trevelyan was uh, trying to bludgeon Evan Davis uh, into a submission as she went on and on about how world beating some of the vacuous ideas that she was coming up with were. And uh, I was just getting fed up with this world beating, world leading uh, so, sort of, uh, nonsense. So was I. I. I was listening to the same interview and that's what made me so furious. Yeah. She was wittering on, wasn't she, about we're world beating this and we're, and Evan, Evan Davis, you know, was just saying, but we know what you're saying, but what are you actually doing? What was yeah. world beating about it? I mean, it drives me potty. Now that, that sort of thing is the sort of thing that goes through my mind and says, why are we in this union? Do you get that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I look. I mean, that that is, that is the problem because uh, uh, I don't quite under. There's some things I do understand. I do understand the Brexit vote. I do understand why people voted for Brexit. I do not understand because I deal with a lot of businesses why anybody would decide to do the set a date for doing something without actually having decided what it yeah. is. Yeah. And then and then tell us it's all, all world beating. And that I, I can't understand that. And I can't understand why we're talking about why we're talking up um, as a nation some of the things that we're not particularly good at. Why 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 do we do why do we do that? We have got world beating universities actually. Oh, they're not really world beating, they are just leading they're institutions good. of knowledge. Yeah, I mean, and we've got some leading companies and we've got some brilliant people, but to yeah. constantly tell us how brilliant we are without actually the evidence is a bit sad, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. I mean, one of the things you were talking about earlier was what is it that um, we could talk up about Britain? What is it that brings us together? And I, I think it's very, it's become much harder to articulate that uh, in a world where we haven't got the sort of the commonality of um, heavy industry and the such like that's recognisable across the whole of the United Kingdom. You know, it, it didn't really matter to my grandfather in the merchant navy, whether he was taking coal from Cardiff to Chile or whether he was taking it, uh, or whether he was taking it from Glasgow. Uh, it was coming from the United Kingdom. We were very good at those things. We were very good at building the ships and building locomotives. And that was all, it, it wasn't 
Scottish, it was British. But we don't yes. seem to have that sort of thing now, at least not that I can um, identify. No, I, I, I don't think we do. And we don't, I mean, one of the things I quote in the book is that famous um, uh, US Secretary of State in the 1960s, um, Dean Acheson saying, uh, the, United, the United Kingdom has lost an empire and yet to find a role. Um, uh, and he went on to say, uh, that's the bit that's always quoted, but the, the other bit is much more interesting. He basically said, so what, what could any role be? And it's not just being best mates with the United States. It's not, you know, uh, and we did find a role which was to be more connected with Europe and to see that as our most obvious hinterland and greatest market. Whereas the bit that outrages me about that is that since 1603, part of Britishness and British foreign policy and particularly English foreign policy has been never to be isolated in Europe, never to have the Catholic countries of Spain and France uh, against, against us and, and, and getting everybody united, never to having Napoleon against us, um, uh, uniting all of Europe or the Germans or the Russians under the Soviet empire. I know we've kind of done it in a to ourselves by by managing to irritate most of the European continent um, uh, and also our dear neighbours, in my view, in Ireland, and also irritating the Americans, the Russians, the Chinese, and good, you know, and actually all the developing countries that we're not giving as much money to as we did before. But this is being badged as global Britain. And I find it extraordinary that people buy into this, but there we are. Some people do, apparently. Thanks. Well, uh, thank you very much, Colin. I'm going to bring David in because David has a question. David, if you can just unmute yourself. Am I, am I unmuted now? You are, yes. Good. good. Um, I, I didn't originally put my hand up because it was more of a comment than a question, but it was, I can turn it into a question because there's a long history in the Liberals and Liberal Democrats of um, being interested in something like a federal Britain. Victorian times, they called it home rule all round. But Irish home rule got scuppered, so it didn't get much further. Uh, Lord Acton wrote about ideas of federal Britain as well. I mean, the, the, the concept's been there a long time. Um, now, last year, Liberal Conference, the Liberal Democrat Conference, part of the motion about we should work towards a federal Britain. And I thought the reason we passed it was so that the Scottish Liberal Democrats would have a line to push in this election. But I've not heard it at all. And I'm just wondering why people are so shy about it, why they don't talk about it. And the other question is to do with um, one of the things that made people hesitate about Federal Britain for many years is what to do about England. And people have been worried because oh, England's so big. Could you have a federation where one unit was that big? Um, well, obviously, United States and Germany have far more units, but they do have some that are very big compared with some that are very small, and it works. Um, I'm, just, I'm just wondering why, right across the board, not just our party, but right across the board, people are so shy of talking about this. Well, I, I think that's, that's, that's a great question. You know, David, uh, there... T two things. W one is I, I, the, I end the book by saying that obviously home rule all round, which was a liberal idea, uh, was was the path not taken. And because it was not taken, well, it was not taken, first of all, because of the stupidity of Westminster, because it was blocked repeatedly in the House of Lords. Um, and because of that, we ended up with, uh, it seems to me anyway, the, the, the absolute catastrophe of 1916, Easter Rising and Ireland going on a very militant path, which caused great pain. Whereas we could have, with minimum disruption, uh, it seems to me, have if not solved all our problems, but done something quite different. And you're right, that was a liberal idea. Um, and the second thing I say at the end of the book uh, is, you know, you're right to point out the question of question of it. England and how that would work. But also the other question about uh, it, that's often posed is the West Lothian question. And I, I find that, I find it extraordinary that this keeps, keeps coming up. I mean, nobody talks about the Bavarian question in Germany. The B Bavarians get on with being Bavarian and people in, you know, um, 
and Mecklenburg-Pormann get on with being up in the north of Germany. It's it's just or people in Freiburg. We've got I've got relatives there too, and they you know they 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 just get on with their their they know what is local, they know what is within the lender uh, the lender, and they know what it, what is what is federal. It it is not beyond the wit of man or woman to work this out. And Switzerland is another good example of a place where, which is why I have a bit on Switzerland towards the end, not just because it's rich, not but just because they make cuckoo clocks, but because Switzerland is a place where they've got one group, one linguistic group, the Germans, who are much bigger than all the others, but because they've devolved so much to the cantons, uh, it all gets on, works like clockwork, you could say. So, so it's, you know, if we're so smart at so many things, I, I basically agree with you, why do we not notice that other countries don't have this problem. And again, the United States doesn't have the, you know, the Idaho question. They just have different rules for <laughs> different ways of operating things. I mean, it's just kind of, so why would we have a West Lothian question? I just, you know, it's, anyway, there we are. That's my Thanks. rant over. <laughs> Thanks. But interesting, just to pick up sort of slightly on what you said there, David, is, um, and, uh, and obviously I spoke in that debate in favour of passing the federalism motion because, I thought it was a unique perspective, especially in this election for the Scottish Parliament, that we could put forward to to the electorate. Um, I think it's you know that there's and Gavin, you, you might agree with me on this. I think equate the problem sometimes with equating federalism in Scotland, and I have done this. I've given interviews where I've talked about this. Uh, probably the worst phrase to use a third way, you know, with the context that people think of about that. But this idea there is a third choice. It's not just the status quo versus an independent Scotland. But I think Gavin, at times, sometimes people they view it with a little bit of scepticism, especially in parts of the west of Scotland. If you are a hardline unionist, you think federalism is just a step towards an independent Scotland. And I think some people in an independent minded view think, well, you can have a federal Britain, but a lot of the things that I'm concerned about, like, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, Trident still being on the Clyde, that's not going to change for me. So I'm not actually getting what I want. It would be interesting to maybe think, you know, do we need to think more about how we actually communicate to people what federalism is? Because I don't think a lot of people in this country understand what it means and what it will achieve. Well, I, what, one of the, I, yeah. One of the problems with that, and I'm I'm doing actually I've got it on my desk. There's a there's a new um, uh, book coming out very shortly called Unwritten Rule, and it's written by a couple of former permanent uh, under secretaries at government departments and Lord Green, who used to be the chair of HSBC. And it's very interesting, and it calls for a essentially a federal constitution for the United Kingdom. And that's, I think, why they sent it to me to. It begins with the words, the United Kingdom faces a constitutional crisis that could lead to its breakup within the next few years. And they go on. So, so we're all kind of thinking about the same, same thing here. Uh, but the one thing I'm going to say to them, and I've already said to one of them, is the problem with this is, for most people, it's boring. And I'm sorry, <laughs> you know, when you say con the word constitution, as opposed to, you know, what's going to happen about my football club? Is it going to join the Super League or, or you know, uh, you know, I can, I can, there are and many dog whistle things. I mean, the football thing is important, but you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Whereas when it came to things that I supported and I'm sure everybody listening supported, like changing the voting system for Westminster to some kind, some kind of fairer system, it didn't really grab people and it should have done. And I don't know. So, so I think I think getting that debate started when the constitutional debate has already started in Scotland in a way, as you suggest, and it's it's always been going in Northern Ireland, is very difficult to do in England. I think people don't people understand that things are not going well, and they don't particularly like government, and they don't particularly like Westminster government, and they think they're all in it together, all that kind of stuff. But they don't see that one way of changing it would be to change the constitution. And I don't. I, I confess, I don't. I don't know how to get that message through um, to to voters who've got other other things on their minds. Well, final question from me, Gavin, before we we let you get off and have an evening, because I know you've got time constraints. Was um, obviously you you decided to stand in the European elections because it was an issue that was exceptionally important to you. Is there any prospect in the future of a, a big issue getting Gavin Esler to, to stand in politics again? 
I, I, I don't know. I think I, I should say uh, that I, I stood as a Change UK candidate because Change UK really didn't exist. And because one of the things I thought was uh, I, I, I could not have stood for um, the, the Conservatives and the, the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, and I looked at the Lib Dems and thought I, ca I couldn't stand to be asked about everything that the Lib Dems did when they were in coalition <laughs> with, with the, uh, the Conservatives. And Change UK was, because it didn't exist, was a kind of clean sheet. And I think one of the things that the good thing and I enjoyed it very much. I really did enjoy the dialogue and I enjoyed, uh, I, I think most people go into politics for good reasons. Most people don't give up their evenings and go out leafleting because they, they wanna make money out of, you know, I don't know, selling PPE or something. Um, I, I, and I think that, that confirmed it. And also the other good thing was I did see some of the darker side of journalistic colleagues. And there's, there's a few that I wouldn't have anything to do with in the future. So that may mean that, that my political chances of running for anything are somewhat diminished in the future. No, thank you, Gary. I mean, it's a, it is a minefield when you get involved in it. So it's certainly, a, I don't blame you for maybe thinking there's other projects you'd rather spend your time on. So, but Gavin, just from, from my side, I'd just like to say a, a very big thanks for taking the time out to, to, to speak to us. And obviously, thank you to the people who did, did ask questions, and we appreciate you attending as well. And um, I, I hope people do go out and pick up a copy of the book, How Britain Ends, not How England Ends, How Britain Ends. Uh, and, and if they... <laughs> pick it up in, in full form or if they do what I did and listen to it in Audible while they're out leafleting it's a great read and certainly I think it raises a lot of questions that we, we seriously need to think about so Gavin thank you so much for your time Thank you very much and thanks for everybody for tuning in Thank you